And welcome everyone. My name is Shirin Kosropur. I'm director of the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies at ACC. I'm also a psychology professor and department chair for interdisciplinary studies, which includes the degree program in peace and conflict studies. So if you have any questions, or if you wanna know more about our work at the center and also at the department, please feel free to contact me or Leila um, from whom you've been getting emails. Um, just a tiny bit about the work of the center. We, um, uh, the center is focused on peace and conflict or the model of conflict we use is conflict transformation, which acknowledges that conflicts are a normal part of all relationships and necessary for change to occur, to, to have something better built. And um, this is a good example of how we need to have something better built to support um, a segment of our population, part of our, um, part of our, our world. Um, the peace studies part, um, the definition of peace in peace studies is um, includes social justice. So if you don't have justice in the world, you don't have peace. You can't have sustainable peace. That's not a peaceful world. So um, this film is very uh, was very powerful. I hope you all did get to watch it. If you didn't, I think you can still really get a lot out of the discussion and then you can watch the film afterwards. Um, I may watch it again after this discussion. I looked up, um, you know, as, as I um, know something about violence against um, LGBTQ community, but today I looked up specifically some data about uh, violence against transgender people. And I'll um, read to you a little bit from Human Rights Campaign. Um, 2020 has already seen um, at least 40 uh, transgender or gender non-conforming people fatally shot or killed by, by other violent means. And since they started keeping track of this data uh, in 2013, this is the highest number they have recorded. And this is only a part of what gets um, part of the partial number because not everything is um, reported and recorded. Um, and the um, victims were killed by acquaintances, partners, or strangers. Some, uh, some of these um, um, perpetrators have been arrested and charged and some have not. Uh, three of the murder victims were in Texas, San Antonio, Dallas, and Houston. And um, you probably know this already, um, the fatal violence disproportionately affects transgender women and particularly transgender women of color um, and, put, and even more specifically black transgender women. Um, so this isn't something that just, you know, we're, we're discussing it in this particular case that happened in the Philippines, but it's all around us. And if you don't personally know someone who is transgender, um, it's still the world we live in and we care about um, having justice and peace for people. So um, without further ado, I'd like to quickly introduce um, Dr. Mark Cunningham, our professor, film professor, who uh, is in charge of this Cinema of Conflict and Transformation film series. This is the second film in the series this year. And now that you've registered for this event, you will get um, notices of other upcoming events that we have, including more films in the Cinema of Conflict and Transformation series. Also this Thursday, we have a, um, uh, an event about uh, peace and relationships that you may be interested in. So look us up. Um, Mark Cunningham is a, a, um, an associate professor in RTF, Radio, Television and Film at ACC. He received his PhD in RTF from UT at Austin. And he's contributed essays to national publications, several anthologies and peer reviewed journals, focusing on such topics in film and television media studies as John Singleton's film, Poetic Justice, Spike Lee's semi-autobiographical film, Crooklyn, actor, um, sorry, um, I'm gonna skip this. He has a long uh, distinguished bio but I'm gonna skip to the most um, recent work that he's, he's doing. And that is working on a book on 
Race, Gender, and Narrative in the Trilogy of Films about South Central LA, written and directed by the late John Singleton, and it, it, that will be published by Columbia University Press. So thank you, Mark, you're on. Thank you. Well, yeah, you make me sound, I sound good on paper, but this guy, PJ Raval, who I went to, PJ and I were at UT together. Uh, and so that's how I know PJ, but you know, that my bio sounds good, but PJ sounds better. Uh, <laughs> PJ, uh, as we know, award-winning filmmaker, cinematographer, uh, really whose work explores and overlooks as his bio says on this film's website, uh, explores the kind of overlooked so, uh, subcultures and identity within the already marginalized LGBTQ plus community. Uh, you know, PJ is such uh, distinguished uh, honors as being named one of Out Magazine's Out 100, Filmmaker Magazine's 25 New Faces of Independent Film, uh, has done such movies as Trinidad, which was broadcast on the Logo Channel on Showtime, Before You Know It, which is about the lives of three senior gay men, which is actually really good. Uh, and not that, I mean, it's a surprise that it's actually good, but I'm just want to put in there that I've seen it. I want to just give it a plug there, that it's really good. Uh, and, and also broadcast on PBS like this film did. But PJ, PJ also shot the Academy Award nominated uh, documentary, Trouble the Water, which is also good. And PJ, if I can just say this, PJ is also a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences documentary branch so this dude gets to vote on the oscars so uh and so I'm, i just you know uh feel you know really privileged uh you know as in terms of his work which i really admire and not just saying this because i'm in front of you guys i really admire your work uh i really think what the work that you're doing is very important and so it's just cool that i got to breathe some of the same air you did man so <laughs> so without it here's pj let's welcome him <laughs> oh, thank you. Thanks so much. I mean, what a what a really great uh, introduction. <laughs> so it's thanks. true, man. It's <laughs> and true. I can't wait to read your book. That's oh, cool, man. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I appreciate it. So, you know, I thought uh, if we could, it might be helpful to start the discussion off with showing the trailer uh, to the film, if we could do that. Uh, do, do I have the ability to do that, Layla? I have, I have it queued up already. If you don't, do you have, I have it already queued up. I muted, sorry. Uh, you should have access to the share screen okay. function now. Good deal. All right, here we go. So let's take a look at the trailer before we get started. Jennifer Laude through social media. I felt a connection to her as a Filipina trans woman. Jennifer had a nickname doon, pero si dito sa akin ganda. Kasi nung maliit ba siya, nasabi niya, maganda ako, maganda ako. Kaya pag laki niya, ganda talaga ang tinawag ko. JGP ay isang transgender ang natagpo ang patay kagabi sa Olonga po City. Isang dayuhan ang hinihinalang suspect sa pagpaslang. Reports out of the Philippines say the Marine and the victim met in a nightclub. The two left the club with one of Jennifer's friends and went to a hotel where they were captured by security cameras. You cannot help this case if you just know things about the murder because it's not a simple case of murder. <laughs> The relationship between the U.S. and the Philippines is really a relationship between a colonizer and a colony. With the VFA, it's like the Filipinos are being served in a silver platter. There's a lack of justice in many trans people's lives. Members of our community are killed every day. Basta ang point lang naman namin dito ay mabigyan ng justice ang kapatid ko. 
baka maulit ulit kasi ganun din. So, wow. Man. So I, I want to start out by saying, uh, PJ, just how tremendously affecting this film is. And, and as Shireen was saying about how, you know, this is the world that we live in and the fact that there's, there are, of course, right, so many people as, as your film uh, is a testament to that are not willing to understand that or certainly have not gotten to the place where they can understand that. And the fact that, you know, this is a story, I think very much so about what it means to be human. But at the same time, also in some respects, what it means to be inhuman. Uh, because the way Jennifer is treated in this film, you know, and, and with the way Jennifer, as your film depicts, I should say, you know, is, you know, there's just no excuse for this. I mean, I was just, I mean, I've seen this a couple, this, your movie a couple of times and just really just incensed every time about how her body was left. I just can't get over that. That image just kind of remains a bit, you know, kind of indelibly etched in your mind when you see it. For sure. So if I could ask you, you know, what is it about this story, Jennifer's story per se, right, that said to you that it had to be made, that this story had to be told? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of things there. Uh, you know, one, um, you know, Shireen, in your introduction, mentioning the violence against trans women of color, you know, as someone, you know, I'm, I'm a member of the LGBTQ plus community. Mm -hmm. So I've been very aware of that for um, many years, right? Like this, this uh, you know, I think a lot of LGBT people, um, uh, you know, grow up with um, a culture of violence around them, um, understanding that they will be the target of violence in some way. And certainly many of us know that trans women of color are at the top of that, right? And, and that is sadly, that's something, um, you know, globally that's occurring. Um, but for me in particular, I think the story of Jennifer Laude also because this was so clearly a story that also um, was looking at US imperialism in the Philippines. For me, what was really um, uh, important in being able to share Jennifer's story was that it so clearly connected the violence that she experienced to these much larger issues of military power, imperialism, colonialism, um, you know, and even in our current moment of the United States, right? We're, we're linking all of these things to white supremacy, right? Things like that. And I think um, a lot of the times when we are thinking about um, hate crimes or some kind of injustice, uh, I, I feel society tends to, um, limit it in terms of um, a specific community, right? Um, so if the LGBT community is facing violence, then it's all about, um, you know, it's it's all about um, just specifically thinking about, uh, you know, what is it about LGBT people, right? Um, what is it about that? But in this case, it became clearly also about the United States versus the Philippines, right? Um, and I think there was something there that intersected all of these things together, right? Through Jennifer's lived experience. Um, and so for me, it was also an opportunity to be able to look at this at a much more complex um, and complicated way that, um, you know, that um, people are not getting from a news headline, for instance. Um, and when I was given that opportunity to be able to speak with the family and be able to file, follow that story, then it became very clear to me that this could be a really um, powerful way to share Jennifer's story, to really to look at these kind of issues. Wow. So from a filmmaking or a technical standpoint, do you find it kind of difficult to get in those spaces to be able to, you know, kind of take, you know, take apart some of these issues that you're examining in the film? It is, you know, sometimes it is, I, you know, for me specifically thinking about, you know, documentary and nonfiction filmmaking, I think a lot of it for me is also, you know, A, it's about thinking about, um, you know, what is the story and how are you telling that story, right? And who are you in telling that story? But, um, but also a lot of it is just what's the access that you have, you know, um, 
you know, what access uh, do you have? And so in this case, um, I, you know, I found myself having access to, um, you know, kind of like the key players in, in Jennifer's story, largely, you know, her family, and then also attorney Virginia Suarez, um, you know, the prosecuting attorney. And so that was something that, um, you know, the, the Laude family attorney, that was something that, um, really made me, um, you know, commit to this idea that I could tell the story the way that I wanted to. Wow. I mean, it's so funny, you know, that you mentioned the family, her family, I think her mother is just an incredible force of nature, I think, and just, you know, really kind of, you know, just fighting, you know, as much as she can to make sure that justice is done. But as she mentioned so often in the film, you know, how difficult that is, not only because Jennifer is trans, but also too, they're poor and how, you know, that affects the way that they're able to get justice. And, you know, one of the things I found most interesting about the family and, and, and certainly wanted to know more about, I was like, oh, but this is not what the movie is, is I was very struck by her sister's son in the story and him talk and, and her and the mother saying, I know that he's gay. And, 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 you know, what does it mean? Like, as you were talking about knowing that there's this kind of current, if you will, of violence around you when you have that. And for him to be related to Jennifer and have had this happen to her, you know, how does that affect his development as a young man that's, you know, gay and coming into his own, you know, uh, sexually? Did you get to talk to him anymore? Uh, I did. I, I, you did. Oh, cool. I did. I'm I'm very much in touch with the family, and mm -hmm. um, and I'll share with you some of these updates. Is that um, you know, um, this you know this film we we were nominated for um, kind of the Philippines version of an Oscar mm -hmm. for for um, best documentary, and and so I invited the family to come with me right to the to the ceremony, um, and. Um, uh, Jennifer's um, nephew, who's Aaron, who mm -hmm. you're referring to, um, came to the ceremony as Sabrina. So now Aaron mm -hmm. has assumed the identity of, of Sabrina's and um, identifyingly openly as, tr as trans. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, uh, you know, at, at, at the time um, was living in uh, Manila. Um, Jennifer's sister had moved there. Um, and Sabrina had moved along, along with Cheska, the, the younger um, mm -hmm. sibling, and um, was seemed to be doing really well. And I think, um, I think part of that was because um, everything that happened to um, his aunt, Jennifer, mm -hmm. I think everything was kind of on the table for discussion and, um, and really thinking about the kind of care and what um, the support that um, Sabrina needed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of that was also, um, uh, you know, um, supporting Sabrina to live elsewhere and feel like their opportunities were, um, you know, that they were maybe be given more opportunities outside of this environment. Mm -hmm. um, but speaking to Sabrina, I know that she really misses Alangapo actually, because that's where she grew up. Mm -hmm. um, and would like to, you know, go back there, but I think was using this time as a, as a way to explore her explore her identity mm -hmm. mm. Um, in a way that maybe she felt a little bit more safe in wow. doing so. Oh man, good for her! I'm glad to hear so, that. Yeah, hear that. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, I was really really struck by that watching the film, and and then like I said again, I had to remind myself this is not what the story is about. But I was really intrigued by you know, you know trying to be yourself in that space. And this has happened to your aunt, you know, and what that means. Well, I'm glad you picked that up because for me, one mm -hmm. of the themes that I was exploring in the film also is this idea of cycles, mm -hmm. right? So that's why for me also at the end of the film, you know, when I'm looking at kind of like the history of the Philippines, I'm starting to include Jennifer now as part of this, right? Like okay. her story becomes part of this lineage, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I'm glad that you picked that up because yeah. you know Aaron now Sabrina is also part of that lineage, right? Nice, awesome. So you know, and I, as I was watching the film and looking at some of the the stock footage, the news footage in particular, uh, they kept referring to Jennifer as Jeremy in in total disregard, right, of her of her identity. So you know, what do you think this says or or said at the time about the seriousness in which the case was being taken in the Philippines, and how did do you think that affected the uh, the outcome of the trial in any way, or how people kind of you know 
acted around the situation as it occurred? Sure. I mean, I think, you know, the way that you um, experience uh, the media uh, and the reporting that was being done was kind of the way that it really unfolded, right? There was a lot mm -hmm. of misgendering at first. Mm -hmm. um, and part of it was a lot of um, uh, lack of education. Sure. You know, I think the media really did not understand uh, the concept of trans identity. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a, there's, you know, many reasons for that. I think the concept of gender and sexuality is different in the Philippines than it is here in the United States, for instance. Um, you know, Naomi Fontanos, who is one of the trans activists in the film who gives that really great oh. speech at the courthouse, mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when speaking to Naomi about um, kind of cultural differences between the Philippines and the United States, for instance, you know, Naomi has told me, um, personally, that she felt like, um, you know, in the Philippines, there was a lot of cultural awareness of trans identity, but maybe not, uh, maybe not um, political power, mm -hmm. right? And almost in the uh, United States, it was almost different, right? There's mm -hmm. a lot of cultural acceptance that still needs to happen, but there's a lot of emphasis on political power, right? Um, mm -hmm. And politics, thinking about like things like bathroom bills, but yet we're even talking right now, like maybe there's people who've never even met someone who's trans, right? Like this idea of, um, you know, where 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 that uh, identity uh, rests in the in the in the landscape of uh, of our cultural kind of awareness, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think in the Philippines, it gets complicated because, um, you know, these concepts of trans didn't really exist in those kind of words in the Philippines, right? Um, and as we, you know, as the film goes into, there is this history of, you know, pre-colonial, you know, pre-colonial times, this identity of, you know, um, of a more gender variant or, um, you know, uh, those with like a female spirit, you know, all of these kinds of terms. And that's always been linked to, um, you know, sexual identity also, right? And, and, um, and sexual orientation. So there's always, so for a while, there's been this concept of, um, you know, born male with a female spirit or, fem you know, feminine males. And that was kind of, considered trans, but those individuals were still considered men, right? right? So so there's a confusion there because the misgendering could be that or it could just be blatant misgendering. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think uh and I think in both cases it points to um a lack of education there in terms of what Jennifer would have referred to herself as, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, she refers to herself as she, she referred to herself as Jennifer, right? Mm -hmm. Um and I think, um, you know, as you see the as you see the reporting continue, you start seeing a uh, man dressed as a woman, mm -hmm. you know, you know, uh, you know, to, um, uh, you know, a gay man, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing now to a trans woman. Mm -hmm. um, you see that kind of education happening live. Right. And I think what's also happening behind the scenes is there are a lot of trans activists who are correcting, you know, correcting the reporters and putting out their own information about um, who Jennifer, you know, is and was. And I think um, that is, is also what's happening. Um, so I think to answer your original question, there's, there's several things happening. One, there's some active misgendering, uh, people who clearly are not understanding it. But then there's also um, what we can't discount are those who maybe understand that or are choosing not to. Right. As a, you know, um, in terms of not maybe in terms of not honoring Jennifer mm -hmm. in the way that she would have been, you know, wanted to be referred to. So I think it's a combination of both. And I think, you know, as, as we recognize, you know, misgendering and transphobia does exist. Yeah. Um, so there could be some of that also. Wow. Thanks, man. Well, I just want to say to our audience, too, is it going like, if you also have questions, please type them in the uh, chat and we'll get to those as well. I was going to know there's a. There's a lot of things that happen in this film and a lot of things to discuss and unpack them. Uh, I don't wanna hog the conversation. I wanna invite you all to come in to ask, you know, PJ, uh, what you'd like to ask him about the film or just about trans, you know, transgender, about the community, anything like that that you maybe need clarification on because I think that's so important what you mentioned, uh, PJ, about this kind of lack of education. I mean, and as we well know, right, this is not just 
in the Philippines, this is in America as well, right? Where this kind of just complete, you know, and the education is available. It's there, right? And, uh, you know, and, and it just doesn't happen. And so, you know, but in thinking about a case like this and the way, for example, uh, the American soldiers largely protected from his punishment for murdering Jennifer, you know, what does this say? And am, am I correct in saying, uh, PJ, that you're Filipino or a Filipino? I am. Right. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's what I thought, but I didn't want, I said, I, I wrote that and I was like, ah, uh, but what does it say to someone who is both Filipino and American as yourself? You know, how do you, def how do you define or measure allegiance when you're presented with circumstances like this? Yeah. I mean, you know, so I describe myself as, you know, Filipino American. Sure. There's a term mm -hmm. nowadays that some people are using Filipinex mm -hmm. American, um, which I've, you know, been embracing recently. Um, and, you know, my parents are born in the Philippines. I was born here in the United States. Um, I grew up, um, you know, in the public education uh, system in, in California. Mm. And I grew up knowing um, the lack of education about the Philippines, right? The lack of, uh, you know, um, the Philippines being omitted from a lot of US history books when clearly the, um, you know, the Philippines history rests so heavily upon the United States, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, it's, and it's ongoing influence. So for me, you know, telling this story, it puts me in an interesting place because I think in one hand, as someone whose family comes from the Philippines, um, I feel a connection to this place that um, I did not grow up in, mm -hmm. you know? And at the same time, here in the United States, um, I, I'm someone, and I very much recognize my 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 family are immigrants, you know, um, and so I'm kind of in between these two places. And when I first started thinking about this film, um, I think what I had realized was for a long time, um, you know, growing up, I had looked at that as. Um, uh, I don't want to say a disadvantage, but maybe something that um, separated me from what I considered like the American experience or American identity, right? And I think in the process of making this film and getting older, I think I started understanding this puts me in a unique position that's advantageous, right? Because I'm able to view things from a very specific lens, from a very you know specific perspective. Um, and I think this idea of um, allegiance, right? Yeah. Like your word of allegiance, um, I think is, is a really interesting thing to think about because what it also allows me to do is if I'm looking at a story about the colonized and the colonizer, if I'm looking at a story about imperialism, um, I am I am living in the empire, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like I am making this from someone who's living in the country mm -hmm. of the colonizer, you know? Mm -hmm. So my work is to be done here. Um, and I started understanding that in, in a way that, um, you know, I never really looked at it before. Like for me, I had always thought of the Philippines as other and another place and, and if I start thinking of me and my actions and what I'm looking at as, as kind of the bridge between mm -hmm. those two places, then really my place is to change what I can here. And so largely part of me making this film was to bring it to American audiences and to use it in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Philippines knows what's going on. They're living through it. Mm -hmm. It's the rest of the world that doesn't understand this. It's the rest of, you know, it's the United States. It's the citizens of the U.S. and those living here in the U.S., um, needing to understand what their government is doing overseas, mm -hmm. right? Needing to understand what the actions are of the United States and the military and how that greatly affects people in the other side of the world, right? So when we read a headline like this, we understand that we are the ones who are responsible for this, right? This is our government going there doing this. This is our military going over there and doing this. Um, you know, and and having... You know, having just um, experienced um, the election, right? All of us experiencing this election, 
Yeah. Like we, we have to also think about, um, you know, our civic responsibilities and duties, right. in terms of voting, you know, in terms of like thinking about who these elected leaders are thinking about who is representing us, who is, you know, who's making these decisions, um, and what power do we have? Right. Um, so I started thinking of it in that way, right. Me mm -hmm. as a filmmaker, this is my role in it. Right. My role is to capture the story and share it. Right. My role as a storyteller is to tell the story of Jennifer Laude so this doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. um, and and for me, what I've been embracing is that unique position of being in the empire and doing that. Right. Mm -hmm. Like changing it from within. Yeah. Right. It would be very different if I were a filmmaker you know, living in and from the Philippines trying to do this, because then I would be doing it from the outside, but I have the ability to try to do it from the inside. Oh, wow. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, that's something that's, um, for me, important. So this idea of the allegiance, I have allegiance to both, yeah. you know, I very much, I very much do believe that, um, you know, uh, we have the power to do something like this in American politics, but at the same time, I'm, I'm, you know, very much recognizing what's happening in the Philippines and, and, and realizing what I change here can affect what's changed, you know, what's, mm -hmm. what's happening over there. Yeah. I mean, so you, you, that you mentioned that about, you know, being, you know, we we're the man, so to speak. Right. In that regard. And I, I you know, watching the doc and, 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 and looking at how critical, for example, they are, you know, of, of president Obama, of Barack Obama, which is so very different, right. Than, you know, a lot of the language, you know, certainly where he's involved, you know, in, in terms of how we talk about him versus Trump and what happened. And, you know, it's a very different kind of conversation. And uh, it, it kind of made me, you know, bristle a bit watching it, thinking like, wow, I mean, you know, when you're only looking at it from this perspective, how narrow that is and how privileged that is to be able to just look at it from this singular, uh, you know, perspective in that way. Yeah, I mean, I really thought about that looking at that. It was like, Obama, we don't want you here. Get out, you know, and it was like, wow, you know, <laughs> and it was like, you know, but yeah, like I said, their experience with him is quite different for sure. Yeah. So, you know, and could I, I, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, it's good to know how you identify um, PJ as a Filipino American. Um, because it was evident from the film that this isn't just some sort of white savior outsider mm -hmm. um, with a good heart, you know, going in, telling the story of these oppressed people. You know, it, mm -hmm. it was done with such sensitivity and, and depth at the same time that it was clear that this isn't an, a complete outsider telling some other people's mm -hmm. stories. Um, and I think that's really important. That's a good point. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. And that was something that I really thought a lot about too. That was, there was a lot of hesitation actually for me um, starting to make this film because I was very conscious of, you know, just to give you an example, like I'm going to be paying a cinematographer a certain amount of money. And for that amount of money, like, you know, the family that I'm following, who knows how much, you know, that could um, support them. Right. Uh, so there was a lot of having to recognize um, the privilege that I carry, the privilege I carry as an American citizen when I'm in the Philippines um, and really being mindful about that um, and making sure that I'm not, um, uh, you know, making sure that I'm honoring, the, you know, what's actually there. And I think and I think part of that is also, you know, for me making films, what I love about it is being collaborative. So. Um, you know, so part of, so part of what I did also was making sure I had um, a producer in the Philippines, and that I was working with people there who could also make this with me, right? To make sure that I'm not, um, you know, I'm not, uh, uh, you know, um, taking something out of context or um, pushing my own agenda onto something that maybe isn't there. So, but thank you for that comment. Yeah, it was something I was definitely very conscious of in the process of making this film. So in the film, I was really struck by uh, the comment about those, or the observation, I should say, actually, that people who are transgender are often kind of relegated to two lines of work, whether it be this, uh, the beauty industry or sex work, which I thought was really interesting. And, and, and I think about how often I've seen that in American film and television content. And I think most 
you know, significantly in my head is Laverne Cox playing, who had her own issue uh, with, with a, a transgender, you know, attack on, because she's transgender. Uh, and I'm thinking about her playing Sophia Bursette on uh, Orange is the New Black and she's the hairdresser there. And then she just did a film with Justin Simeon called Bad Hair, where she played a hairdresser again, uh, even though, you know, there's a little bit more malevolent forces at work in that film, but still. But uh, so is there a thinking, right, that these two areas of occupation make people who are transgender less seen by the public at large, for example, or, you know, why do you think this is, these are the industries? that transgender people, you know, women in particular, find themselves, you know, basically kind of herded towards? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just, uh, a, first of all, it's a limit of opportunities, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, wh one thing that was really interesting for me was when I first screened this film, um, there was a trans person in the audience, right? Mm -hmm. um, and one of the first comments they said was that they appreciated how the film uh, presented the role of trans women in very many different roles, right? Um, as a sex worker, as, um, you know, um, yeah. in the Philippines, they say parlorista, um, but also a journalist, mm -hmm. you know, an activist, mm -hmm. like all the different roles that, um, you know, these trans women can have, uh, depending on what opportunities are available to them, right? Um, and I think, um, you know, that is, that's something that we have to take into account, like what has been, you know, what opportunities have been given to them, right? Mm -hmm. So when I'm, you know, so when we are thinking about Jennifer, um, you know, and we're thinking about just her basic survival, what, what are the means of her survival? Is that sex work? You know, what jobs are, you know, what jobs are available to her um, in terms of opportunities? Um, and I, and I think, um, you know, uh, the line of sex work obviously is so much heavily in line with the, uh, the area that she um, lived in being a largely, you know, U.S. military um, occupied area, right? And what do the soldiers want, right? Um, what is the industry there for that? So, um, so part of it is that. Um, in terms of, in terms of working in, um, you know, in, in terms of the beauty industry, um, I, you know, honestly, I haven't really put too much thought behind that, but, um, I'm just going to, and I'm not, I'm certainly not an expert on that, but I'm just going to guess it's, I'm sure it has a lot to do with, um, just the own, um, you know, their own physical care right in terms of themselves um and where they can take that kind of um mm -hmm. knowledge and expertise and use that um you know it's 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 um it's also very complicated because uh you know when we think about um you know the trans community especially in the philippines we also have to take into consideration class mm -hmm. right um and 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 wealth or lack of wealth, mm -hmm. right? And so also along with that, you know, um, you know, maybe comes what education and other opportunities they're uh, afforded to also, and what that would allow them to um, enter in terms of professions, right? So there's a lot of there's a lot of barriers that um, you know these this this community is facing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think um, because of those barriers, they're also being limited into what kind of professions that they can have. I mean, interesting enough, we started this conversation talking about, um, you know, Jennifer's sister's um, mm -hmm. child, right? Mm -hmm. Who, um, while uh, they've been in Manila, have been working in a call center, right? Mm -hmm. And this is something that, um, interesting enough, has also... Um, largely transformed um, job opportunities for the trans community, right? Because if they're being limited, maybe this is another field that they can enter. Um, if they can speak English, for instance, right? Then um, I, what maybe a lot of people don't realize is a lot of the call centers, you know, like you call your credit card, you call a, you know, a, a hotline, you know, for something. A lot of those um, English call centers are being farmed out to places like India, places like the Philippines, places mm -hmm. where um, the English speaking workforce is um, are, is getting paid less <laughs> than the United States. Mm -hmm. um, 
but can speak the language, right? So, um, so that's something that's kind of transformed um, the job market for trans uh, women specifically wow. in the Philippines. Um, you know, the film doesn't go into it, but um, you know, but I'll tell you that um, you know after Jennifer's um, you know story became um, much more widely known. Um, in Congress in the Philippines is very similar to the United States. There's a House of Representatives and there's the Senate. Um, the House of Representatives for years have been trying to pass a bill called the SOGI Equality Bill. And SOGI stands for Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity and Expression. And it would be a bill that would uh, protect the rights of LGBTQ plus individuals um, and be an anti-hate crime bill. Um, it had failed for 15 years, I think. Um, and after Jennifer Laude, um, it was reintroduced into the House by the first trans congresswoman in the Philippines um, and, and supported by um, you know, several House members. Um, and it passed. Um, it still has not passed the Senate, sadly. So it's still stalled, but it's made a lot of progress. And I think that um, even says something. Right, that it took um, you know the first transgender congresswoman to reintroduce it successfully into into the house. So, um, but even with that, um, you know, obviously this um, congresswoman comes from a very wealthy family, you know, where she she had opportunities to be educated at some of the top institutions, um, and someone like Jennifer didn't have that opportunity. Wow. Right. Um, and so because of that, her, her, you know, her, um, her job, uh, prospects are also very limited. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a question from, uh, one of our, uh, audience members, one of our, uh, and says here that the film brought a lot to, of light to how diplomacy works with the U S military and occupied regions in an almost immunity has Jessica's story, uh, rather Jennifer's story or other recent incidents had an impact on the policies the U.S. takes towards their soldiers committing crimes in foreign countries that you know of? So, you know, in the Philippines, the U.S. military is protected by the Visiting Forces Agreement, right? Um, this is an agreement that largely um, appears um, around the world. I think off the top of my head, I think there's 32 other countries where um, what we would call status of forces, um, uh, which is a very similar idea, right? The idea that um, American, you know, U.S. military has a certain uh, impunity in these areas or are under the jurisdiction of the U.S. government, right? So in a lot of these agreements, they have to be bilateral. So it means both countries have to agree to it. And they do, right? For lots of reasons, um, and it's in places that are very similar to the Philippines, right? Like Korea, for instance, South Korea. But it's in places that I think people don't realize, like Australia or Germany, the UK, right? Um, and maybe we don't realize it because they don't get challenged in the way that they have been in other places in the world, right? Um, uh, I'm sure it happens in terms of um, some kind of military abuse, um, you know, some sexual violence towards a woman in Germany, for instance, but we tend to hear of it more in areas like um, Southeast Asia, right? Like the Philippines or South Korea or Okinawa. Okinawa in Japan is another big place where there's been a lot of women that have been raped or murdered by US military for whatever reasons. Right, it tends to be in these areas um, uh, that are in certain parts of the world um, uh, where we see these being challenged. Um, so, does it impact the policies? Um, sadly, no, because that is the policy. <laughs> you know, the policy is to protect um, the military, especially during during these things, which is why what you start seeing is in countries like the Philippines or South Korea, there are um, from their side, these efforts to um, change the policy, right? To get rid of the visiting forces agreement, to challenge the status of forces agreement. Um, but again, thinking about it from the side of the empire, right? It needs to happen also from this side. Mm -hmm. um, 
And there are people who are trying to do that. Like there's a lot of Filipino American activists, for instance, who what they're trying to do is introduce a Philippines Human Rights um, Act into the US Congress. And part of that would be looking at this. Um, but as we know, the mili- you know, the United States has one of the strongest and largest militaries in the world, right? And part of that is um, using different parts of the world as extensions of the military. So, um, so sadly, I think um, the military gets prioritized over the human rights of um, mm-hmm. of these of uh, you know of these people elsewhere. Um, so what would it take to change it? It would have to be a bilateral change. One side would have to disagree. And um, specifically thinking of the Philippines, um, President Rodrigo Duterte, the president of the Philippines, um, had threatened to um, had threatened to um, you know terminate the visiting forces agreement. Um, sadly, he didn't. And it was kind of an empty threat. Um, but he was making that threat because at some point, there was um, a Philippine senator that was trying to come to the United States. And I think with COVID and everything happened, they rejected the visit. Um, and I think there was, you know, those, it angered basically, uh, you know, Duterte um, and he threatened to, to terminate it, but he didn't, you know, and I think um, it was, a, it was not a surprise to a lot of people that he didn't terminate it because the, the, um, Philippines security and military is so heavily dependent on um, American military. Um, so is there a real incentive for um, the Philippine government to um, terminate the visiting forces agreement? I mean, I think from a moral and ethics standpoint, we'd say yes, but from a military strategic point, maybe they would say no. And I think that's going to be the challenge that the Philippines faces um, as a former colony of the United States. From the United States side, it's clear why would they, mm-hmm. right? They, you know, why would the United States, um, you know, change that? So, uh, but do they have the power to? Absolutely, right. It's just a matter of getting the right people in the room to 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 vote that way. So. Um, So, yeah. So what I will say about it is these policies are put into place, you know, when we're when we're thinking about things that are structural and institutional, it's both. Right. This is a great example of where, um, you know, this protection is written into this into this agreement that's in both sides. Right. Um, And so we do have to think about, um, you know, ways to change it or ways to change the institution. Right. And who's who's governing that institution. You know, uh, well, good question, Brandon. You know, um, something I think about all the time as a person of color and, 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 and seeing, you know, particularly as you mentioned the election and how seeing how things have kind of played out in the last four years. And really one of the things I find kind of interesting is why there seem to be, particularly people who are in power and control, but certainly just people in general that are seemingly threatened by people who are from marginalized cultures or marginalized groups uh pursuing justice for themselves and why that's such an issue for people and so you know this is a question i posed in our last film that we watched about the black panthers and specifically about fred hampton and and i'd like to pose the same question to you in reference to jennifer's story and just in terms of the lgbtq community uh also as well uh why is it such a threat you know why do you think the acceptance of the LGBT, uh, LGBT, LGBTQ plus community uh, proves so difficult for people in general. And I know there are obvious things that we can talk about religion, we can talk about all that. But, you know, why do you think there's such a, why is it such a threat? And what do you think we can do to combat these kind of negative, this negative energy and these negative ideologies that we have about people who are gay, lesbian, trans, bisexual, and queer and such? Yeah, you know, going back to a point I made earlier, like for me, what was important to look at with Jennifer's story was the concept of imperialism, Mm -hmm. right? Because imperialism is about power, Mm -hmm. right? In order to colonize, you have to someone, you have to have someone being colonized, right? Mm -hmm. So there's always this power 
imbalance that's enforced, right? Someone gains their power by taking away someone's power. And I think that's the case for um, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the isms that we see, racism, sexism, uh, ableism, right? All of these kinds of isms, it's, there's something there in terms of someone wanting to gain power by taking away someone's power. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, and, and I think that's the case. That's always been the case for, um, those in the LGBTQ plus community, right? Um, are they doing anything that would take away your power? No, you know, they're, people, people are asking for equal power, right? And that's threatening, right? People, the one thing people never want to do is give up their power. And they certainly don't want to um, give up their privilege and their power, right? And so there's ways to justify um, that, right? By saying people are other and other means they're uneducated or uncivilized, they're Mm -hmm. savages, right? Things like that. Um, When we think of the LGBTQ plus community, we think of othering as in their... um, you know, an abomination, right? When we are thinking of, you know, religious persecution, you know, uh, from a religious perspective, right? They, um, you know, and all these reasons why um, they should not be treated equally, mm-hmm. right? Um, and all the threat. And what's, uh, you know, and thinking about that um, kind of line is even seeing it in the film, right? When Naomi is talking about when Spain colonized the Philippines, the first thing that they did was they tried to eliminate the heads of the state, right? The heads of power, which tended to be women, um, shamans, trans women. And so what do they do? They demonize them, right? So what they do becomes a threat to you, Right, a lot of the a lot of these uh, medicine women and shamans were also midwives, mm-hmm. right? So if people are delivering babies, then you spin the narrative and say, well, actually they eat babies, so keep them away from babies, right? They're witches, they're brujas, you know, all these ideas. It's it's ways to, um, it's it's ways to take power away, mm-hmm. right? To eradicate, and I think. Um, that's always been the case, you know, um, and, and and I think one ways, you know, you're asking like, you know, what's a way to to change that or counter that, is is to change that balance of power, mm-hmm. right? So what happens when we have people in power who are not thinking that way, you know? Why is it important for us? I'm, I'm you know, I'm sorry, I'm on this political kick, but we just lived no. through this election. Right. Why is it important for us to have the first, um, you know, black and Asian, um, you know, vice president who's mm-hmm. a woman? That's in, that's important because now we have this person in power. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and clearly she will come with a, a certain amount of lived experience and awareness that maybe someone might not. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and also maybe it shifts our ideas of who can be in power and what kind of power. Mm. Right. And it starts it starts breaking down that boundary, I think, or that barrier that's kind of placed there. Um, So I really do think, you know, kind of going back to, um, you know, my earlier point of changing things from the inside, you know, this is something that a lot of, um, you know, the Black Lives Matter activists are talking about, movement for Black lives, right? Talking about different strategies of how do you change like what are strategies of change you change from the inside and you change from the outside and there's a balance there Mm -hmm. right it can't be just one or the other it has to be both um and so i so i do think um you know part of the change is you know people like me or people from the communities that are feeling that um marginalization occurring to push back (laughs) and Mm -hmm. saying i'm demanding my equal rights i'm demanding my equal respect um and likewise um, I'm relying on people getting on t- the inside to mm-hmm. also help me with that, right? Mm-hmm. And meet me there, right? So if I say this is an inequality, then someone needs to be on the inside and say, yes, let's change that policy so we address that inequality, right? There has to be that back and forth, but it can't just be one way because if not, I'm just going to be talking to no one who's listening, right? I need to find those allies. I need to find those people who are in the inside. And so um, I think it's a matter of that balance, right? And that's why we all know representation matters, right? Representation does matter. You know, um, it sends a signal, 
right, to everyone of, of a certain amount of awareness and what's possible. And I really do believe the like, see it to be it. So it, so it's important to see it, right? Um, and we all know that, right? We've seen all those clips of like, you know, young kids of color who are like, I can be president when, you know, Barack Obama got, nom you know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, it was inaugurated, for instance, like, that's important to change that mindset and to change what you think is possible. Wow. Uh, Shereen says, since local elections are also important in policy, but yes, absolutely. Exactly. So true. I absolutely forget about, agree people with forget that. about that. Yeah. People just think like, it's kind of like I always say to people, everything doesn't have to be big. Everybody focuses on the biggest thing. And then there are these smaller things that need to be addressed that everybody looks over. And local elections are so important. Who your mayor is, who your council people are, all these things. You know, it, we, we've got to, we, we, I mean, we've got to be engaged with every last bit of it. Like you say, in order to do exactly what you're describing. Yeah. So, the, so uh, yeah, it starts at the bottom. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my final question for you, PJ, and then we'll take some more questions afterwards if there's time, is that, you know, finally, with, with you know, with this, what I think to be a very important film that you've done, uh, you know, what do you hope telling Jennifer's story will achieve? Like, what would you like to see this very important work do for all of us and for media culture in general, too? Like, how, you know, what would you like to see this film do? I, I want people to take action you know to be quite honest like part of part of part of me making this film was to um you know um to enrage you you know to frustrate you um and to connect it to you somehow mm -hmm. you know um and again thinking about this idea that um you know that's why for me it was really important in the film to show meredith going to new bedford right um yeah. which was the home of of pemberton because we spend the whole time in the philippines and it's so mm -hmm. easy for us to think like oh this is happening in another another place in the world right but then she manages to go to new bedford which is not very far from where she is at the time and recognizes like oh this happened here you know this is where it started actually mm -hmm. it started in you know in this small town in the united states someone what did they learn what did they think you know, you know, how are they raised and how, how are they, um, you know, like, what are all the things that they were brought up with in the fact that they're going to go over to the, another part of the world and, you know, think that they have a certain um, power there to do whatever they do, right? Um, and questioning that, right? Um, and for me, that was really important because we always think about, um, you know, what happened to the victim um but we also you know think about taking responsibility for the perpetrator mm -hmm. you know um and that that is very much something that we need to look at also as the issue right it's it's yes it's the issue of violence but also thinking from the preventative what allowed that violence to transpire in the first place mm -hmm. right um what yeah. conditioning you know, was this person subject to what environment? Um, and so for me, that was important to bring it back to the United States and, and be like, yeah, you know, like, what did he learn about, you know? I, and, and I love that she's questioning it. Like, I wonder yeah. if he learned about LGBT people. And his school, sister was, you know? apparently, which I and think- And his sister was, right? Which so, is also okay. makes things very complicated. How much right? do you because think we it but I was gonna say, how oh, much do you think it has to do with the military culture? I was in the military myself. I was in the Marine Corps for six years. And I, that is a hyper masculine atmosphere. And there's not room, there's no wiggle room, particularly when I, in the dark ages, when I was in the Marine Corps, uh, <laughs> there's no wiggle room at all for any alternative masculinity or sexuality or whatever else. How much do you think that that may have had a lot to do with his behavior as well? Because looking I'm at sure. his upbringing, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think it's probably a combination of a lot of things, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think, um, you know, there's some scholars who just write it in terms about, you know, gender identity, right? Like this idea of masculinity coming from a patriarchal society, right? Why, you know, why is it that we, why is it that we associate power with strength and violence? You know, mm -hmm. um, you know. Sadly, that's kind of what our, you know, sadly that's kind of what our, um, 
you know, society has been, you know, um, brought up around. Right. Um, so I think, I think it's, I think, um, so yes, I think part of it probably is military, right? Because when we do think of military, we think of them as force, uh, being able to go into these areas. But I think our, also part of it is, um, him growing up as, um, as a cis male, you know, here in the United States. Right. Um, and that idea of masculinity and what is, and, you know, equating masculinity with that power, right? Um, masculinity is, is rarely equated with compassion and kindness, <laughs> right? It's, well, it's, it's equated to strength and dominance, yeah, that's true. right? I mean, it's true. Um, yeah. And we can't get around those ideas of like, even that idea of like, um, you know, male figures as fathers and female figures as mothers and mothers being nurturers and fathers being disciplinarians, right? Like these ideas, like there's so much of that gender divide. And it's interesting because, you know, as someone who's queer, like I do have friends who um, are, are parents and they usually make that joke. Like, you know, I will have a friend who is a male, cis male, um, and will have a kid and say, oh, I'm the mother. Right. Because what I when I say mother, I'm not saying a gender role. I'm saying that I'm assuming the role of nurturer. Right. And breaking away from that idea of equating gender and that kind of trait together. Mm -hmm. But we have to be honest with ourselves. That's what happens in society. Right. We we tend to assign that concept of nurture with femininity with women as a gender. Right. Right. Um, I mean, it's true. I mean, I think about in my barber shop and the way a lot of the men think they need to relate to their sons is like punching them in the chest and, you know, cursing at them and stuff like that. And it's just so, and then when, and then when you do see a, a man that kisses his son, I think about the picture of Joe Biden kissing his son and everybody made such a tremendous deal out of that. It's like, is this really masculine? And it's like, what in the hell? It's 2020, you know, and y'all yeah. are still talking about, is this masculine? Yeah. 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 So I think, and, and you know, and I think that's why, um, you know, bringing up Pemberton's um, sister being an open lesbian, I think that's, you know, that was also important because it shows someone that you think could be an ally or at least is aware mm -hmm. um, can still, you know, be part of this, um, you know, conditioning that they might have experienced where they're, you know, um, equating this idea of trans identity or something as lesser than, right? Someone from the Philippines, lesser than, someone who's poor, lesser than, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but again, what I think was important for me to see was that um, Meredith looked into, you know, where he grew up and realized he was, he didn't grow up with that much privilege either, maybe, right? That he grew up in this very working class environment and maybe he wasn't, you know, um, given access to, you know, go to Harvard or something like that, right? Um, that maybe there are certain, um, you know, certain options that were afforded to him as well. And so in the same way that Jennifer was kind of limited in certain things, maybe Pemberton also was conditioned in a certain way to be, wow. you know, um, to wield this power, right, as a cis male, um, you know, in a different part of the world. Yeah. I mean, I think Sharon and I were, and, and Layla and I were talking about this before, uh, you know, we spoke with you and, and Sharon, I think if Sharon, if you don't mind me saying, made a very good point about this is his own kind of internalizing of, you know, gender roles, all this other stuff, and that he took that out on her, that that was, you know, very much so about his own internal struggles. Yeah, um, for sure. Yes, so yeah. for boys and men, yeah, only a limited range of behaviors, yeah, is acceptable in the U.S., right? She said, so he could have been, he he, he could have a lesbian sister, but it better have been self-loathing, and if he thought of himself as having sex with a man, yeah, that, which is what, yeah, I was just mentioning, she she was always on the, on the way to saying what I was, <laughs> but yeah, that kind of internalizing that. Uh, someone says, watching the film, I felt like Meredith and her journey as a Filipino trans woman was also part of your story. How do you connect with her? Yeah, Meredith is interesting. I also think too, Meredith kind of clashing a little bit with Naomi in that one scene, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, yeah, what, what do you, what do you, yeah, how, how is Meredith part of the story that you're telling here as well? Yeah, so I met Meredith because when I first started making this documentary, I, you know, I was kind of very quiet about it, but I told a couple friends um, and one of them was friends with um, Meredith and so connected mm -hmm. me to Meredith and said, oh, you know, you should really 
talk to her because she's starting to report on on this. Um, and as soon as I met Meredith, I kind of knew she was someone that um, I wanted to follow for this documentary because in a lot of ways, um, her being an investigative reporter, like she would um, ask a lot of the questions I would, you know, so I could do this on camera and follow her investigation and mm -hmm. in the process have it parallel my own. Um, but also, you know, Meredith having been born in the Philippines, also trans, you know, also uh, living in the United States, like um, she might even go deeper and ask different types of questions than I would and bring to, you know, bring to it her own um, experience. Um, so for me, it was really incredible that, um, you know, Meredith allowed me to follow her and then also allowed me to share some of her um, really, um, you know, great writing that she did about um jennifer and so yeah so definitely meredith was like a really integral part and thinking about that scene that you're mentioning i mean mm -hmm. one thing that um i really appreciated about meredith was also meredith's recognition of um you know what opportunities she was given right like mm -hmm. um and she even thinks about that right that um in the film she says you know uh, you know it's in a different set of circumstances she could have been jennifer Right. Like if yeah. she if she didn't, you know, if she was not able to do the things that she was, then may, you know, then maybe her situation would have been very different. Mm -hmm. And I think there is something um, for me really powerful of her recognizing that in the process of doing this, like she's seeing in the process of um, her investigating Jennifer. I think she's also reflecting upon her own life. Right. And the path wow. that she's also been um, afforded. Wow. Yeah, it's just I mean, the whole thing is just like you said, like I, just all of the paths that you take. Are so I mean, so I, always, I kind of felt like watching that, that all of these people individually could have been a documentary into themselves. Right. And kind of talking and just centered around this issue, this very like, again, this human story that you tell. And we didn't talk about as much about uh, Nane. Is that is how you say it? Nane? Nane. Nane, yeah. Who is yeah. I just love. Uh, and and just that her spirit as a mother and trying to, you know, like I say, again, deal with all of the things that happen, you know, not only to her daughter, but just the things that are just happening in terms of the the pursuit of justice and the lawyer, who I think is also incredible. Uh, one of the things that I thought was very telling in, in the film is when she, you know, goes to her before the mother before the uh, the trial and say, look, it almost like saying, like, don't get your hopes up. This is how this is. It may go this way. And then kind of preparing themselves for, you know, you know, the outcome that they don't want. And really, technically, they still really didn't. They got some justice, but they didn't get the justice they deserved, I think. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Does anybody else have any yeah. other questions? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, PJ. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, Jennifer's mom was, um, you know, a large inspiration for me wanting to make this film. Cause I, you know, I happened to be in the Philippines um, right after the crime had been committed. And I ended up on a panel for LGBT rights alongside Virgie, the attorney, mm -hmm. uh, the Laude family attorney. And, um, and it was on that panel that I saw a clip of Jennifer's mom. And she was basically saying, you know, how could someone do this to my beautiful daughter? You mm -hmm. know, how, how could, oh, her child, she technically says child, you know, how can someone do this to my beautiful child? Um, you know, and saying, I'm not going to rest until, you know, until I see justice. And I was so moved by it because, um, you know, putting it into perspective, I mean, Jennifer's mom, um, you know, she comes from a very poor area, mm. you know, um, I think, um, you know, the equivalent here in the United States, I think her education goes to maybe second grade, for instance. And I, and I was just was so inspired by her, you know, getting in front of the camera, speaking her truth, and essentially galvanizing <laughs> like mm -hmm. everyone to get into action. And really nothing would have happened if it weren't for her um, having that kind of courage right and being brave in front of the camera to take on like the you know take on the united states essentially <laughs> oh, you're um, really right no you know so i really um i just think uh you know jennifer's mom is incredible and around the time that i was um you know thinking of doing this film i was also considering some other films um uh, and 
part of me was interested in looking at um, gender variant kids and, and their parents, right? And this idea of parenting. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting is I was reading all these stories and looking at all these stories about like, you know, parents who are having a hard time, you know, accepting their child and, you know, all of these things. And then mm -hmm. here was this woman who like undoubtedly, you know, was very much like my, you know, my child, she's so beautiful, mm -hmm. you know, she's amazing. And like, you just feel that unconditional love just everywhere. Mm -hmm. Right. And I was, and that was something I just found very, very inspiring. So even though this is very dark, right. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at some really um, dark areas of humanity. I feel like we're also seeing this real like um, love, you know, and kindness there that, um, I think is powerful. So it was, you know, so for me, that was such a large, um, you know, reason for making this film. And hence the title of the film too. Yeah. You know, that's the title of the film, yeah. Does anybody have any other questions for, for PJ? Any, any comments about? I, I have something real fast. Sure. Um, because it wasn't just, it, so it was like Jennifer's family was um, very accepting of since they were young, at a young age for their transgenderism. Do you think a lot of that has to do with um, the story that we heard about pre-colonial times and um, trans people being considered uh, shaman or more so like, I don't know what the word is. They were more, they were more respected pre-colonial. Do you think that, do you think that that still lives in that or, or is it, is it like here in the United States where it's almost like you go to a small town in the Midwest and you see somebody who's trans and you're like, oh, what is this? Yeah, so I mean, just using your um, analogy there, like in the Philippines, if you go to a small town, you might actually um, run into someone who's trans, whether or not they identify it, identify as that. Um, and I think that is kind of, um, you know, the point that I made earlier that Naomi said, this idea of cultural awareness, like um, there's a lot of, there's a lot uh, more openly gender variant kind of individuals, whether or not they're accepted and whether or not they're um, revered or not, or demonized, uh, the point is they are, <laughs> right? Um, I mean, what's interesting is, um, you know, like I think the um, United States, um, you know, speaking of Laverne Cox um, earlier, like Laverne Cox was on that um, cover of Time magazine where it said the transgender tipping point, right? Like that was a big deal. Um, the Philippines have had, um, you know, trans individuals or gender variant individuals in movies and televisions for years. You know, like, know so that was part of the comment of, you know, one of the, you know, like when we look at movies in the Philippines, some of the, um, you know, romantic comedies or even the kind of like films that, um, you know, are some of the biggest box office hits actually um, star um, uh, an actor named um, Vice Ganda, who, uh, I don't know if identifies as trans, but definitely appears as women in films. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, and is very much, um, you know, maybe a non-binary gender variant. Um, so, so that's what I mean by I think there's a cultural awareness of it, right? Whether or not it's acceptance, I don't know, but there's definitely an awareness of it. So that idea of saying like, well, I'm gonna go to a small town and, you know, there might be someone who I, you know, would label as trans, you know, working at the local convenience store or at the gas station, you know, um, says a lot in terms of like the cultural landscape of the Philippines, that maybe the United States um, is very different in that regard, right? Um, and it's only been more recently that I think um, people are, you um, you know, where that, I actually thought about it today because you guys know Ellen Page. Yeah, we were talking about that. Ellen Page. Yeah, yeah it just yeah. came out today. I talked right? about, it, about, um, about that today, yeah. And said they're identifying as trans and going by Elliot, right? Elliot Page. Mm -hmm. And so um, that, that was, you know, that was to me, it made me think about in the Philippines, there's, um, <clears throat> and I forget their name, but there's um, a performer who's kind of like our version of like Shirley Temple 
who, um, you know, was, um, you know, very much this kind of like on screen, um, you know, presence who's um, uh, trans, you know, and identifies as he, him now, and is still equally as popular, <laughs> you wow. know, just in a different way. So kind of went from this very Shirley Temple kind of identity to now this, um, you know, male identity, but still kind of in the film and entertainment kind of world. It's kind of interesting to see that kind of evolution, right? Um, so I don't know. So I think, here, you know, I think here in the United States, it's just a matter of like, um, you know, the cultural awareness um, right. being raised, you know? And the education you talked about, for sure. People become yeah. more educated. That's cool, yeah. Wow, I mean, you taught me a lot today. I had no idea about <laughs> that in, 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 in you know, Philippi the, the film and in, in television industry in the, in the Philippines, you know, it being like that. Shireen, I was going to ask that question, Shireen. Yeah, what, what do you mind telling us what you're working on now, or is it a sure? No art yeah, I'm. Yeah, I have a couple new projects. I'll tell you about one. Um, I have one project that I'm working on right now called In Plain Sight, and it's a group of um, eighty um, visual artists um, supported by different um, activists and community organizers, and. Um, they are protesting um, immigrant and migrant detention. Oh. Um, and what they've done is over the 4th of July weekend, they sky typed messages. So, you know, using sky writing, they mm -hmm. sky typed messages over detention centers to point out where they are. Um, and the messages, you know, are everything and everything, very poetic, you know, poetic resistance. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I'm using, um, I'm looking at that and and looking at a way to um, uh, to kind of change the conversation about migrant detention and um, mm. and immigrant detention mm. and the culture of incarceration. Um, so that's one of the projects that I'm working on. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, and I have another project that I'm um, that I've developed that also takes place in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. I can't really discuss too much yet, but um, there's definitely more <laughs> following. Are you, are you following directing both of these? Seen. Yes, yeah. Cool, they do. So have you moved on from just being purely like someone cinematographer to now just directing your own stuff now? Pretty much. I mean, I still shoot every so often, but I'm, you know, I just am so busy just kind of trying to direct and produce my own work. <laughs> right now so then, so then I'll, never, I'll, I'll never work i'll never work with you now so <laughs> maybe one day no no you're too, big time, you're too big time you're too big time i'm i'm small fry compared to you man so yeah um so if, if there's nothing else man pj thank you so much man for doing this solid for me and 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 doing it for us and talking to us about this i've learned so much just beyond uh the information that i receive in the film and man i'm so i just want to tell you i'm proud of you man and Keep it up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for um, you know inviting me here. Thank you for you know watching the film. Yeah. Thank you for having these conversations because they're important, you know, and, and the discussions that follow. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, buddy. All right. So uh Sharon or Layla, I want to end out in the conversation. Thank you. Just more thank yous. Um, really appreciate your work. Um and uh all the good talk. And Mark, you ask as always really great questions. So, oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> And thanks to all the participants who joined us tonight. Yeah. Um, we'll be sharing this video along with the film with our community. So people who didn't have a chance to join us will have access to, to the talk yeah. too. Right. Thank Looking you. forward to Thank your you. work. Thank you. Take all care. Right, good night. Good night. Be well, everybody. Bye-bye.